Welcome to the second edition of Jacques Delors Institute Euro, Euro Questions, our series of short webinars. Bienvenue à la seconde édition d'Euro Questions, notre nouvelle série de webinaires courts. Un service d'interprétation était prévu pour ce webinaire. Malheureusement, suite à des problèmes techniques, nous ne pourrons pas assurer cette interprétation. Euh, nous serons prêts toutefois à recevoir vos questions en français et nous nous, nous excusons pour la gêne occasionnée. Today, we welcome our researchers Eulalia Rubio and Andreas Eisel will analyze the state of play of the negotiations between the European Parliament and the Council aimed at adopting the next multi-annual financial framework. They will discuss the subjects at the heart of the negotiations, such as the budget cuts made by the Council on various flagship programs, the rule of law conditionality, the EU's own resources, and the governance of the European Recovery Plan. Please do not hesitate to ask your questions throughout the webinar by using the Q&A tool available on your screen. Our researchers will answer them in the second part of this webinar. Without further ado, I leave the floor to Eulalia Rubio. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, so we are going to discuss these negotiations and I will try to, to be very brief because we have very short time for discussions and we really want to have few questions. So what's, what's at stake now uh, on the negotiation of this package of MFF and recovery package? We have uh, the state of place that we, we, we agreed uh, an important package at the end of July, the European Council, but now we have two procedures that have to be run more or less in parallel. One is the adoption of the MFF, and for that we need the consent of the Parliament. And there is now uh, the trilogues that are taking place uh, to negotiate with the European Parliament uh, the MFF so as to obtain its consent. And on the other hand, there is also the unresolved decision, which is crucial. The unresolved decision is the decision that sets the source of financing for the MFF, but also it's crucial for uh, seeing the light of this new recovery instrument based on that, because the unresolved decision uh, authorized the Commission to borrow this important amount of, 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 uh, of money on behalf of the Union that is necessary to put into place this new generation EU. And for the adoption of the unresolved decision, it's mostly on the, on the side of member states. We need the adoption by unanimity uh, of the Council and then the ratification uh, by all member states uh, at the national level. So we have a note, we, we, we wanted just to discuss today the, the, the issues at stake in the negotiation with the Parliament. We are now in the middle of the negotiation with the Parliament and there are four main issues that are uh, at negotiation with the Parliament. One is the reinforce of, uh, of uh, uh, top up, the, the parliament asked to top up some uh, flagship programs. Uh, some of the programs that were uh, cut in the negotiation with the European uh, Council, the parliament right after the, 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 the agreement in the European Council, they approve a resolution and this resolution, they list up to 15 flagship programs that uh, they wanted to see reinforced in the MFF. Another question is the rule of law conditionality that was uh, a, a, a thorny issue in the in negotiation in the, in the European Council. And the Council ended with a very ambiguous agreement on that. The principle was agreed, but then the procedures were not clear. And this is something that has to be agreed now uh, in more detail under co-decision between the Council and the Parliament. And the Parliament has already said that it's very important for them. And actually they, they, they have already said that uh, the four main parties of the parliament have said that they conditioned the agreement to the MFF to the adoption of a robust uh, rule of law conditionality mechanism. Then there is the question of new armed resources. The parliament, legally speaking, does not have capacity to adopt the armed resources decision, but always uh, links MFF with armed resources, which is very naturally because armed resources as I say, is the financing uh, issue, the, the, the source of financing of the MFF. And uh, the parliament asked to introduce new one resources and also has said that this is a condition for them to give consent to the MFF. And then there's the question of the governance of this new recovery plan and particularly the new facility, which is the main problem within the recovery instrument, in which as Andreas will explain later on, there is also an issue about the role of the parliament in this governance. So let's, let's see these four issues more in detail. If we look at the, the, the first issue, as I say, is the reinforcement of some uh, programs. Uh, there is a list of 15 uh, flagship programs that has been uh, proposed by the parliament. And now in the trilogues, the parliament is trying to negotiate with the, with the council whether there is, it is possible to increase the budget for these programs. Now on the, on the side of the council, what we have is some reluctancy. To, to, to say the least, to, to increase the, the, the size of the programs, also because 
uh, many member states are not willing to increase the overall size of the MFF and therefore reinforcing some of these programs implies uh, taking out money from other programs and that's very delicate. Uh, that, that took many, a lot of years to arrive to this agreement in the Council and therefore it's difficult to find where to, where to find new money to, to reinforce these programs. It's possible that we, we find some reinforcement. I think that uh, there will be some gesture from the part of the, of the Council, but probably we, we will not see or we cannot expect significant increases in, this, in these programs. And the other issue is that for the moment also the Parliament has not been clear in single, uh, singling out which of these 15 programs are more important for, the, for them. So that's also something that the Council asked to the Parliament to try to single out which of the 15 are really important for the Parliament. The second issue is the rule of law governance. As I say, this is, this is probably the most uh, thorny issue now, the most difficult issue now, uh, because positions are quite uh, opposed. We had a lot of difficulties to, to, to pass the agreement uh, at the European Council at the end of July, uh, basically because uh, there were two member states, Hungary and Poland, that were very adamant about keeping a better right uh, to any type of mechanism uh, linking uh, the, the, the disbursement of EU payments to the, to the respect of rule of law. In the end, the principle was acted in the European Council, but it was ended up, it ended up with, very, with a very vague, uh, vague, uh, vague uh, compromise that led to different interpretations. Um, the, the, the most um, contentious issue there is probably the decision-making rule to suspend EU payments. The Commission had proposed at the beginning to use reverse qualified majority voting, meaning that the Commission would propose uh, suspension in case of generalized efficiency of rule of law. Uh, and then these suspensions would be uh, adopted unless the Council were able to, to, to form a qualified majority against it. The Council, most of the Council does not agree or do not agree on that and the Council, try, many member states, what they want is to see classic qualified majority voting, that is the Commission proposing something and the Council adopting, adopting in under qualified majority voting. And then we have these two, two member states, Poland and Hungary, that ask for unanimity uh, to, to, to have the capacity to block any vote. And as I say, it's very difficult to, it's difficult, to, it will be difficult to have to compromise because uh, on the one hand, we have the Parliament that have explicitly said that this is very important for them and that will be a condition to give the consent to the MFF to have something robust and, and effective. And on the other hand, we have Hungary and Poland that have threatened to block the adoption of the own resource decision, which is, as I say, necessary to see the recovery instrument uh, taking place in case uh, of having uh, an agreement on, on rule of law conditionality that, that is not on, on their liking. Uh, but it's important also to take into account that the decision-making rule is not only the only issue on rule of law conditionality. There are other issues under discussion that might also help to find a compromise there. And the Parliament has asked from, has, has, has already put forward its position and asked for other things. For instance, it asked to include uh, robust provisions to protect final beneficiaries in case of suspension of payments. In ask also to have a role in the procedure because it doesn't have it for the moment in the procedure of uh, suspending payments in case of um, lack of respect of rule of law. And then a very important point, which it, which is uh, it has done uh, suggestions to change and to modify or to concretize the list of generalized deficiencies of rule of law that would trigger this mechanism. And there, it's a point that it's going to be probably important. And maybe maybe we see also some uh, some uh, type type of trade-off between, you know, some concessions on decision-making rule uh, by, from some member states in a change of uh, restriction of the list of, uh, of uh, circumstances that can trigger this mechanism. That's one possibility. Then I, I will leave uh, the, the floor to Andreas to, to talk about the two other issues. Yeah, thank you very much, Lalia. So uh, another of these four issues that uh, we would like to talk about is uh, new own resources. And um, the big issue is how to finance, especially the next generation, next generation EU uh, plan of the 750 billion euros over the next decades. And uh, new own resources in the form of European taxes or, or levies um, are a key um, probably to achieve this um, without having to have overly big cuts um, on the rest of the EU budget, basically. And in its council, um, agreement um, um, or, or conclusions of, of July that the Council actually stated the ambition to introduce 
new own resources and specified especially a plan already for um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism and for, for a digital uh, levy. Um, and as well, there's the, the um, non-recycled plastics contribution plan for 2021. But the European Parliament here um, is very much pushing Je vois, for... Il a des Je um, vois Andrea Eisel qui a une barbe. Um, sorry for that. Um, the, the European Parliament is pushing very much for a legally binding calendar. So um, while the Council basically um, agreed there should be ambitions toward this, there's um, little concrete there, even if there's a sort of um, time calendar, but the, the European Parliament wants to push for a very concrete um, calendar of when um, these new uh, own resources are proposed basically by the Commission and until when these new um, uh, resources should basically um, take action and, and deliver money. And so um, the, the European Parliament here is going uh, considerably f uh, more directly forward with additional taxes and also with a quite ambitious uh, plan to achieve this. And it's, it's supposed to be done through an inter-institutional agreement between the, the three different um, EU institutions um, that could have a binding character, but um, the, the question is what this means exactly, because um, this would be given inside this agreement in itself and how, how well this could be enforceable in the end. Um, is questionable. So I think uh, we we'll mainly see this as a political tool then. If, if the parliament um, succeeds in creating an interinstitutional agreement with uh, the council and um, the commission, then it's mainly probably a political tool where the parliament can, con can uh, consistently, coherently put pressure on the other actors to actually move forward um, with new own resources. Um, and now to the final point um, on governance. Um, so what, what especially the Netherlands um, achieved in negotiations um, in the council uh, in July was uh, that there's an emergency break um, for the spending um, of next generation EU money, basically, uh, meaning when, when a specific uh, member state has concerns about um, how money is spent uh, coming from the recovery um, and uh, resilience facility, um, then it can basically um, block uh, the, the, reimbur the reimbursement or the, the payment um, of money, at least for a, a certain moment in time. And um, the European Parliament wants also to have a bigger role in, in the governments, governance of the recovery plan. Um, the question is how far they will be able to go. And so um, what it looks like now, I think much more than having better information rights um, about this procedure um, is unlikely. But in any case, the, the, the Parliament would like uh, to push for this. Um, last week, also, the, the Commission uh, put forward this, this guidance on these recovery plans and what would be uh, of extreme importance, actually, um, after having agreed in principle um, on next generation EU, is how the money is going to be uh, exactly spent. And here it will be extremely important and, and we will need to hammer out the details here also um, of the criteria of um, how exactly this money is supposed to be spent and how it is controlled how this money was spent. And so it's very important to have here a responsibility mechanism that is also legitimate in the eyes both of those countries that are in the end contributing in a, in a, in a fashion of solidarity to this and those that will be um, receiving uh, more out of this. Um, and here also the Commission is now coming into play with the State of the Union address where now the, the Commission is also trying to basically encircle a specific policy priorities um, even stronger than before, 37% uh, for uh, climate-related spending and 20% for, for spending related to the digital transition. And so here, this is another uh, key issue um, uh, of, of contention that will still um, happen to see how the, the final numbers will look like and the criteria attached to it. And I'll leave it here and looking forward to questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you both for... for um... Uh, your, your various points. Uh, so maybe I'm going to start uh, uh, for once with a question from, from myself. Um, so my question is, do you think the European Parliament actually has power in this negotiation? Maybe Eulalia, if you want to address this question. Well, uh, we always know that for the MFF negotiations, uh, the Parliament has not a lot of power. It is the weakest part of the, of, of the sides, of the two sides of the negotiations, because it's always, it happens always the same. It's very difficult to get an agreement 
in the council it's under unanimity and therefore there is always this argument of, from the council saying if you uh, force us to touch this agreement the, all the equilibria is 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 is, is money and then uh, it's very difficult to, to touch any single figure of the, of the agreement uh, in the past, if we look at past negotiations, there have always been, anyway, some concessions to the parliament. It's very, it's very inimaginable uh, to, 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 to imagine that, uh, that there will be an MFF adopted as if it was adopted by the Council. So there will be some concessions to the parliament. And the question is how far these concessions will be, how important they will be. Um, I think if we look at the four issues, it's, poss it's, very, it's very possible that they will have some concessions on the sides of certain programs if they, if they come up with a common position also, because it's very important that they, they, to them to be able to prioritize some things. And then uh, on, uh, on, rule, on, on, on resources, as, as, as Andres has said, it's where they have maybe less power because it's really not, they, they don't have legislative capacity. So if, even if they impose this interinstitutional agreement, it will be an engagement uh, the council cannot engage themselves to get some own resources approved. In fine, that depends on national parliaments that will uh, ratify you know, these, uh, these agreements. But on other, on other aspects, for instance, rule of law conditionality, they know they have the commission on their side. So it's important this also. And also some member states on their side. So that can be one issue in which the parliament can make a, can make a, a difference. Uh, so we've talked about uh, the European Parliament. So uh, one of our um, uh, one of our participants is asking, what is the role of national parliaments in all this, and is it realistic that the MFF would be agreed upon on time? And maybe I can add to this question: uh, What national parliaments do you think can can uh, maybe pose problems in this uh, in this negotiation? Maybe Andreas, if you want to. Yeah, I can. I, I can. I can try to, to answer to this. Um, we, we have. We, we're. We're as as Olalia said before. We're dealing with, with with two issues, which is on the one side the the EU budget, the MFF, and then um, we have the the recovery and resilience uh, plan and the money for this, which demands a um, another specific decisions, particular on the on the on their own resources, basically. Um, the I think I think in in practice um, the likelihood that the whole package uh, will go through until um, January um, is quite high actually. I think there is a, a lot of support um, um, also for the the um, the recovery and resilience plan basically and for this for this whole uh, package. Um, and and it would also be um, have very negative consequences if this fails actually. Um, the, the the capacity to find a decision by the council in July. Um, gave quite a lot of confidence that uh, the European Union um, is actually capable of acting when necessary and um, is capable of, of uh, actually putting through quite ambitious programs. And so um, it would be quite difficult actually for national parliaments to just um, topple this whole process and, and uh, put the European Union in a sort of crisis of confidence also. But of course, there can always be um, um, an individual parliament that um, could uh, pose problems. Um, as Olalia said, especially regarding the rule of law, there's a real threat that uh, especially Hungary, but also Poland um, would block this. Um, I, I, I think that uh, these two countries are those where the ratification might uh, uh, pose the biggest problems. Um, but in principle, and I think it will actually um, result in that the rule of law mechanism will not be that forceful, unfortunately. Um, but that's uh, probably, in my view, the the the, pi the price that pr that uh, other actors are also willing to pay, so that the whole package um, basically um, passes. So I think you've uh, touched upon it, but we have a question from uh, Senator Uribe Echebarria, who's asking in French, "Que se passerait-il si le CFP ne serait pas, pas approuvé?" In English, what would happen if the MFF was not approved? Maybe we could also add. add in case of non-agreement, what would be uh, um, a relevant plan B? Yeah, and actually that links to another question from, uh, from Marta Pilati uh, that says, uh, if we can elaborate on the Parliament's idea to split the two procedures of MFF and non association uh, so that next generation EU can move forward first while the MFF negotiations could continue uh, next year. Actually, the, the, the MFF regulations, when they are not adopted on time, there is a procedure already established in the treaty that allows the extension of, of, the, of the ceilings 
of uh, of the of the last year uh, of uh, the EU budget. That that is the 2020 EU budget. So what would what would happen in case we don't have an agreement on the next MFF is that the ceilings, the maximum the maximum ceilings for each heading uh, of the current uh, EU uh, budget for 2020 would be extended for 2021. Um, that uh, that means that in some cases, I mean, that can be understood uh, as a as a leverage for the European Parliament. Why? Because first, you are not you don't start January without any budget at all, and second, because uh, actually, what happened in the European Council at the end of July is that we reduced quite a lot the MFF part so as to have uh, the agreement of all member states to put into place this big recovery instrument. And in the end, we end up with an MF MFF 2020-2027 that is quite limited. And if we compare uh, the ceilings uh, uh, the, of, of the 2021 uh, budget that would be foreseen in case of a new MFF 2021-2027, they wouldn't be necessarily be, uh, higher than the ceilings that we have today. So that's one argument that the parliament can use also saying, well, if you don't agree with us on the MFF, let's, it's not a problem for us because we, can, we, can, we have the authorization to spend up until one level that is even higher than the level that we are going to be together. Uh, now, that's in the theory, that, that's, a, that's a good argument of negotiation. Then in practice, uh, we know that it's politically linked both negotiations and, and it might happen that also member states decide not to ratify the armed forces decision unless there is the consent of the parliament uh, on the new MFF uh, because they might risk, they, they might be uh, afraid of seeing a bigger MFF in the end and having done, having given their consent to this big uh, recovery instrument. So politically it's linked. Um, it is a kind of, uh, you know, difficult a scenario to imagine, but it's normal that in the negotiation uh, as, a, as a negotiatory strategy, the parliament use this, this, this arm, this card, because it's true that the parliament, if you want politically, is not necessary to put into place the recovery instrument. So it cannot be, we cannot be blamed in the end, uh, legally speaking at least, if this recovery instrument is not put into place. That's a bit uh, the argument that, uh, that can be used in the negotiation and the parliament tries also to use it. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question is uh, probably more, more general, but uh, it's from Bruno Pasturel, who's asking, few citizens are truly aware of the amount and projects included into the MFF. How can EU institutions and parliaments be significantly, significantly more effective on this awareness? Well, the question of the visibility of the EU budget is uh, as, as, <laughs> as old as the EU budget itself. I mean, there is always this question of, uh, in, in many cases, the EU budget is spending in, 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 in areas, especially when it's under share management, when the, the, EU spend, the EU funds are spent by national or regional authorities, and people is not aware of that. We have, we have uh, obligations for that. And in the case of the cohesion policy, for instance, there is this obligation also always to give visibility and to portray that this, this project or the other project has been co-financed by the, by, the, by the EU budget. And I think for the recovery facility is the same. I think there is now an article in the recovery facility, especially to avoid this to happen, that obliges member states when they spend this money to say and to, and to, and to portray, to communicate on the fact that this is uh, co-financed by the EU. But then, after all, this is a matter of, of political willingness also of member states and national actors. I mean, even if you put these legal obligations, if they do not want to, to make it very visible, there are many ways to hide it away uh, or to, to, you know, to give, uh, to, 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 to have all the rewards at the national level and not, and not to explain. Uh, and we have seen it already with the publications and the announcements of the national recovery plans in some member states in which the amounts uh, expected from the EU were somehow hidden, actually, in the, in the communication campaigns. So there is, there is always this limitation. It's, it's a matter also of involvement, involvement of national actors to explain uh, that, that that comes from the European budget. Thank you. So some of our participants are asking questions about uh, different flagship programs who have, been, uh, uh, who have suffered cuts uh, recently. 
so one one participant is um, is talking about the EU for Health program. Another is talking about the EU Defence program, and he's pointing to um, uh, President President Van der Leyen's uh, State of the Union speech when she said that the EU Commission commits to fill these gaps. So the question is, according to you, what would be the, fi the available financial resources to fill such a gap? Are we talking about own resources, Andreas? Um, so I think that, that will be a bit too rapid for this. I, th I think Eulalia is uh, more suited to answer um, for this question exactly of how this thing could be shuffled around. So I, th I think in principle, it's, uh, it will be very difficult to, to raise now the, the overall ceiling um, of, the, of the next MFF. So money has probably to come from, from other, um, uh, other policy areas, but the difficulty is that we're already cutting um, at a lot of them. So it will be uh, very difficult to find um, willingness also from actors to to cut in in principle further and others to to reinforce others but maybe Alalia um, has a clear idea which policy areas would have well would the, the first been. thing uh, I would like to say is I, I don't remember exactly the the, the, the what uh, von der Leyen say on this specific topic on topic on the state of union speech but but ultimately uh, the commission cannot decide on that because that, that's something that it's going to be co-decided now between the parliament and the council so even if uh, the commission is willing to fill the gap, that will depend on whether the Council accepts the Parliament's demand to increase or to partially fill this gap that has been created during the negotiations in the European Council. So that's the first question. Then uh, how, how much can we expect that this gap will be filled, and this gap and the other gaps and the, and the cuts that have been um, uh, done to Horizon Europe or to other or the, the reductions of spending in several programs? I think it's very difficult to imagine that it will be a, a matter of uh, a lot of billions to be increased to these programs. And uh, what, what we know is that the Council tries to use part of the margins, you know, the unallocated spending that remains per heading, which is normally used for unexpected uh, events, actually, that gives a bit more flexibility to the MFF to fill these gaps. The problem is that these margins were already severely curtailed during the European Council negotiation, and now we are uh, in a, the total, the total amount that remains in this margin is not very, it's not very big. So it will not be sufficient to fill all the gaps uh, created uh, during the, or, or all the cuts uh, uh, that have been introduced uh, in the in the European Council negotiations. So I, I see very, dif I, I think it's very difficult to imagine that there will be an increase in the overall size of the budget, and also very difficult to imagine that they will cut other programs to fill these ones. So. So the solution will be find some some money in these margins or in the special instruments that are outside the MFF that are used also like the flexibility instrument that is used also in case of uh, unexpected events. But again, that is going to reduce also, also our capacity to to react to unforeseen events in the future. Thank you. So I think uh, that's it uh, for today. It's uh, already th already three. So we thank you for following this webinar. Uh, so the, the, the video replay will be available promptly on the Jacques Delors Institute's YouTube channel and on our website. And we also encourage you to keep a lookout for Andreas and Eulalia's uh, upcoming works on the various topics uh, they treated today. Uh, on s'excuse auprès de nos éditeurs français de pas pouvoir uh, pas avoir pu faire d'interprétation aujourd'hui uh, suite à des problèmes techniques. Uh, on comprend bien que on vous avait annoncé une interprétation, ce n'a pas été le cas. Donc on, voilà, on s'en excuse. Uh, and the next edition of Euro Questions will take place on October 7th at 2.30 p.m. Uh, to commemorate the 250th anniversary of German composer Beethoven's birth, we will organize a cultural webinar to discuss the European dimension of his work. Uh, subscriptions are already open. See you next time, and merci beaucoup pour votre participation. À bientôt. Au revoir.